In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the web challenges from the Hack the Box Cyber Apocalypse. I've currently solved six out of nine of the challenges. I think I'm quite close to seventh, which is testimonial, but I thought the competition ended on Thursday and it turns out it ends on Wednesday. So I just want to make some videos before I leave it too late and then don't end up doing it. The first challenge is called Flag Command. There is no source code to download and the description is not particularly relevant to the challenge. So let's just go and open up the web page. And while we're waiting for this text to load, let's go and have a look at the scripts in here. So we've got this commands.js, which has a load of commands in it. We have game.js, which doesn't have too much in it. And then we've got main.js, which has most of the code. There's quite a lot to go through here. I just had a quick scan through and found that there was some API endpoints. So we've got one for API options and then another one somewhere for API monitor. But anyway, it's loaded now. Let's just try and put in some text and it says it wants us to type help. And there we go, we've got four options. Let's start the game and it will basically ask us to provide one of these options. So I'm just gonna take a copy of this one, paste it in, and it's gonna ask us to provide another option. And it'll just keep going along this path. I didn't actually go all the way through because I went over to Burp Suite and had a look at the API calls and the one, two API options it returns a list of possible commands and you see here's the ones for the first question, here's the ones for the second question that we're currently on, but there's one at the bottom called secret, which sounds interesting. So I'm gonna take a copy of that and paste it in and that returns the flag. The next challenge is called Time Corp. Again, I don't think the description is too relevant, but this time we do have a source code to download. I didn't actually look at it before I took a look at the challenge and the reason being, I'm trying to get better at bug bounty and generally you don't have access to the source code in bug bounty. So if you can try and solve it without that first, I think it's quite a good idea, but then it is worth reviewing the source code afterwards to see what the vulnerability was and how it arose. Anyway, we go through to this page. We don't have too much functionality. We can just check the date or the time. and notice that we have this get parameter at the top format and it has that date format in it. We could have a look at the source. Well, not really much point since we've already downloaded the source code. Now, what I did do here was let's take a, in fact, let me just right click this one and let's do an active scan with Burp. Since I got hold of Burp Suite Pro and I'm planning to do the Burp Suite certification soon, I'm now able to run these scans and quite often it'll just pick up on things. So let's have a look here. We've got cross site scripting reflected. That's not going to be much use because we only had one URL to connect to. There was no admin bot to send a URL to. However, we've got another one here, OS command injection, and that sounds a lot more promising. So we can select a request and we can see what this looks like, what the response looks like, and it's not very clear when it is URL encoded. So I'm gonna send it to the repeater. Let's use Control Shift and U to URL decode it. And in fact, what I should have done there, let me undo it. Let's send it just so we can compare it to the results. Yeah, let's uh, URL decode it. And let's go and see what the result looked like. It had this in it. So that's the command it's injected is this echo and then these two strings. But for some reason, it puts it in in multiple places. So it makes it quite hard to tell where the actual command injection is, what's important and what's not. So you can basically go through here and just maybe change each one of them. So for example, why don't we change this one to an LS? And then we can go back and do our control and U to URL encode it. We send it, but it just comes back with the same thing again. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to replace that with LS, send. And this time we've got views. So it's actually listed the files in the directory. And the only thing there is this views. So we can do now LS plus views. And now it lists the index.php. So we've got code execution. So now we just need to retrieve the flag. However, we don't know where the flag is. It's likely to be like flag.txt or slash flag or something like that. But this is probably the point where you might want to check the source code. I just mentioned that we didn't simplify this down fully. So I think we can actually take out still a lot more of this. And we can basically say in here, we first need a quote, I think. So we use a quote and then a pipe character. And then let's try and do our ls command again. I think that's all we need. Yeah, that's fine. So next we'll do cat and then plus for the URL encoded space and then slash flag, send, and we get back our flag. 
Now you might be thinking, okay, that's great, but I don't have Burp Suite Pro, so how was I going to find this? Well, I'm sure you can see from the commands now that this wouldn't be too hard to fuzz for something like this if we put in a quote. In fact, let me, what if we just do a quote here? Does it come back with an error? Okay, it doesn't, yeah, but you could fuzz around a little bit or you could go and view the source code. So we've got the source code here. And again, we would know where the flag is because we can see there's this flag file that's copied to slash flag. And if we have a look in the code, let's see what we've got this. Uh, we've got this time model and time controller. This is where our vulnerability is. So we've got class time controller and it's taking in our get parameter and then it's going to create a new time model object from that parameter. And the time model object is right here. And that's basically going to construct this. So it's creating this command, which is date and then the format that we provide. And then notice that the output is getting redirected. So that's why we needed the hash symbol at the end of our command. Let me undo that. So if we URL decode this, you see that's the hash symbol. And it's basically commenting that out so that it won't redirect the output away. And then the get time is simply going to execute our command. The next challenge is called Corp Terminal. And again, I don't think the description is too important. We don't have any source codes to download. So let's just go and open up the web page. And whenever we do, we'll be greeted by this login box. There isn't much for us to try apart from to log in. So we put in admin admin. It says the credentials are invalid. What happens if we try and insert a quote in the password? It says invalid username or password. Okay. What happens if we try and insert a quote in the username? And this time we get an error saying you have an error in your SQL syntax and it says Maria DB server. Okay. So there's a hint that we might have an SQL injection vulnerability here. Let's go back again. And what if we try and do then the usual admin or uh, one equals one, and then maybe I'll just try and paste this into both fields, although it looks like it was the username field. But no, it says that the username or password is invalid. Maybe if we comment this out, let's try that. No, nope. okay, same. So let's try SQL map. I'm going to take a copy of one of these requests. Let's take a copy of the first one because we don't want it to be a tainted value. And I'm going to put this into a new request file. So new.request, we paste this in, save it, and then we can do SQL map dash r new request and then dash dash batch just so it says yes to any questions that it asks us but it comes back and says it detected an error code 401 unauthorized and it gave up well that's what you would expect it to come back with because it's rejected the username or password so what can we do about this well there are quite a few options in sql map let's do sql map dash hh for the advanced option and then i'm going to do grep dash i code and look, you can ignore some codes. And I think it actually came up with something similar. It said, do you wish to, oh, wow, there's a lot of options in here. Do you wish to ignore the code? This one. So I'm going to say, yes, let's do that again. And let us ignore code 401. Okay. So it came back to say that it found Boolean based blind, error based blind and time based blind. So we want to try and extract some data. So the next thing will be to list the databases. We're going to do dash dash DBS and it comes back with three databases. I think this one sounds most interesting, the corp terminal. So we'll do capital D and specify that database. And then we want to list the tables. And there we go. We've got a users table. So we'll say dash T users, and then we could list the columns. Although I've got a good idea what they might be. Yeah, username and password. So we'll say we want to select the password column and then we want to dump out the rows. And if we do that, we get back a password hash. And I'm going to go and put this in a file called hash. And then I'm going to run John the Ripper against it. You could also use something like Hashcat for this. And the word list for a CTF will normally be something which is inside the rock U word list, which I'm going to use as well. There we go. It detected the password hash as bcrypt and hopefully it won't take too long to crack. There we go. It took 25 seconds, which is quite a long time for such a simple password. And it looks like a password that we could have basically guessed, but oh well, let's go and try and log in with it and we get the flag.
The next challenge is called Labyrinth Linguist. And again, we don't need to worry about the description, but I have downloaded the source code and started the Docker instance. I'm just going to go straight over to the website and let's do our black box testing again. Although I will mention that because we were able to download the source code, I would recommend just downloading the source and running the local Docker instance, which I have been doing as I've been solving these challenges. It's a lot faster and you can also do some debugging. So sometimes if a uh, something, a command doesn't look like it's executing. You can actually see the output in the server terminal and then you'll know that it is trying to execute or maybe it'll come up with some error and you're able to debug it. It's a good idea. Anyway, another simple web page. We can just put in some text and it comes back with the text that we put in, but it's like been translated into this voxelith text. And that's basically it. We don't have anything else to look at there unless we go and start digging into the source code. So. I'm going to go over to Burp. As you can see, we've got this request here. I am going to do an active scan and then go over to the target tab and let's see what we've got. I can already see that there are some issues showing, but that's not a particularly interesting one. Clear text submission of password. We can, is that even the right site? 94. Oh, it's not. Okay. That would explain that then. Okay. I didn't even run an active scan. Oh, I did run an active scan on that one. All right. The active scan has come back and said that we've got SSTI and once again, a cross site scripting vulnerability. But again, we've got no admin page to submit a URL to. So self XSS isn't particularly interesting. SSTI though is interesting. I'm going to send this request through to the repeater and I'm going to click on send. And basically it comes back here. Let's URL decode this so we can actually see what's going on. So it's got this variable being set as this mathematical equation, 757 times 737. And then it's trying to print that out. And you can see that it does that. Let's just remove this stuff so that it's a bit clearer. Do that. And then we'll do control and U again, send it. And then there we go. So even though we have put in 757 times 737, it's actually executed that equation for us and returns the result. And if we go back to our target tab and to the advisory, it also tells us that the payload contains a velocity template statement. So it's actually told us what type of template engine we need to go and look into. I won't bore you too much with this because there are quite a lot of links you can go through. You can go over to hat tricks or payloads, all the things and Portswigger have some server side template injection labs, but also some research, which includes velocity. But I did find some blog posts that were specific to Velocity. One of them, the techniques in it weren't working for me, but the second one did work. Um, I'll leave the links in the write-ups this, by the way. I've started putting my write-ups on a Gitbook. So if you want to just check that alongside the video and have a look at some of the resources that I use throughout the video, I'll leave them in there rather than talking through them all. But this is one that I found that did work. And basically it's saying that we can do this set command. So it'll allow the execution of any command without the optional plugin. Let's see here. So you can, you can see the command down here. It's going to execute LS and then it's going to wait for the response. And then it's doing this loop to print it out to the screen. And if I go back to the repeater and then just paste this in here and URL encoder send and look, we have listed out the files in the directory. So we could do ls dot dot slash and look what we've got there. We've got a flag file. So now we can just paste this in here and do cat. And there we go. There is our flag. So that's another challenge solved without the source code, but let's go and have a look at it anyway. There was a Docker file which had the flag.txt being moved to, oh no, it's in entry point. So yeah, there's a flag.txt is being moved to slash flag with a random file name, which is a hint that we're gonna have to do some kind of command execution because we need to find out what the file name is or have some kind of command execution so we can do like cat and then flag star. So it'll just cat any, anything that begins with flag. If we carry on looking through the source code, we would see that velocity is imported. So there is a hint of something for us to look into. And as we scroll down, we'll see there's this read file to string. So it's set in this template and it is passing in this text string, which you can see is user supplied. So if it's null, it'll be example text. Otherwise it'll be whatever we sent. And it's going to do this read file to string. And it's basically replacing the index.html with our template. So you can see down here, file path, string replacement. It's going to replace that. And then we have the template being created here. 
And yeah, we're basically injecting into the template and able to execute code from there. Okay, the next challenge is called Lock Talk. I have already downloaded the source code. And again, I would recommend that whenever you're trying this out for the first time, that you do things locally with that Docker instance. But seeing as I've already solved the challenge, I'm just going to go straight to the remote instance. And when we do that, we see that we've got three API endpoints. The first one is get ticket, which should generate a JWT. However, it says that's been forbidden by administrative rules. And then we can also retrieve chat IDs, but we need to enter a JWT and the same for the flag. We can't do anything basically without a JWT. So let's go straight over to our source code and try and work out what is going on. And there is a roots.py, which has our three API endpoints in it, get ticket, the chats and flag. And notice then that there is a JWT. So you can see up here, whenever you request a JWT, it is going to use the JWT secret key, which is defined in the config to generate a new token, the PS256 algorithm. And then whenever we try to access the chat, it's got this authorized role. So guests and administrators can both access the chat, but only the administrator role can access the flag endpoint. And I believe if we go to the config, there's our flag right there. And you can see there's the JWT secret key being created. Not something that we're going to be able to crack anyway. And what else do we have in here? I believe there's something else for us to look at. Well, we want to try and find out, I suppose, why our request was being rejected. Ah, yeah, I remember. Let's go down to conf and have a look at the HA proxy config. And this is the line right here. So we've got a HTTP request deny rule. And it's saying if the path begins, or it's, well, what it's actually saying is URL decode the path and make sure you're checking case insensitive. And then if the path begins with this, deny it. So that's basically it. We can't connect to this API endpoint because of this rule. At this point, I started looking into URL format bypass tricks. I also saw some stuff about HTTP request smuggling in HA proxy, but none of the endpoints take post requests. In the end, what I did here was use a burp extension. So if I go over to burp, I don't think I've got it enabled at the moment, but there is this extension called 403 bypasser. And if we close that, let's go and take our request the one that we made to get a ticket. I'm gonna send that to the repeater. And then if we right click in here, go to extensions, 403 bypasser, and then bypass 403, and then open up all the issues at the bottom. I believe it should show up in here. It's either issues or event log. Issues, oh, they're not in order of time. That's not very useful. Okay, HTML does not specify char set. Request, response, forbidden, okay. Let me see, I don't think I need to change anything here. Let me try and go to, is there anything in logger? Okay, it is sending them through. Oh, there we go. All right, it just took a little bit of time. Okay, so the logger is actually showing what it's sending through as it's going. Uh, these are all the requests it's trying. You can see it's trying to URL encode. It's trying to insert a lot of semicolons and things like that. And eventually it found several bypasses. So here we go, request one, it has, oh, request one is just the default, so it's forbidden. Request two, it has URL encoded a forward slash. So there are two forward slashes here. And then the response is an okay with a ticket. The third one did something similar by the looks of it, and it got a ticket. The fourth one used a dot and it got a ticket. All right, so there's loads of different methods that we can use to bypass that 403 and get ourselves a ticket. And once we've got a ticket, then we can just take a copy of this and go and set up our cookie. In fact, what I'll do, let's just do this a little bit easier. I'll just take a copy of the URL and then I'll go to the browser and paste it in. Oh, okay, that didn't work, I guess, because of the URL encoding. Okay, let's just... All right, well, you could just paste the cookie in in your dev tools, or what we could do as well is show the response in the browser and then take a copy of this. I don't understand why the request in browser or show response in browser is so slow because it's just making the same request. That took about 30 or 40 seconds, even though I sped up the video for you. So if anybody knows why that is, let me know. I don't understand it.
Anyway, do we have, oh, we're supposed to paste in our token there. That makes a lot more sense. So I didn't actually need to do that at all. All right, paste it in here. We put in a chat ID and then we can get back all the chats. I did have a look through these. There was nothing of interest. So what we're interested in is the flag, but obviously we don't have authorization. And you can take this over to jwt.io and go and have a look at the details, or you can use something like JWT tool or one of the burp extensions, although I didn't have much luck with those. And it'll basically break down the token. So you can see our algorithm. We have got our expiry, our initialization time, and this is like a token ID and NBF, I'm not too sure, not before, I guess. And then the role and then the user. So it's the role that we're interested in. We need this to be administrator. So we could try and just like tamper as is. Let us, if we do dash H, it'll bring up all the options here. You can either do dash T in capitals and go through like a, a help menu, like an interactive menu to do this, or you can use dash I to inject claims. And then you need to specify the payload the header or the payload claim, and then the header or the payload value along with it. So for example, let's say we wanted to inject a claim and we wanted the payload claim to be the role. We want the payload value to be administrator. And then we would actually want to sign it, but we don't have anything to sign it with. So I'm just gonna take a copy of this. I just wanna demonstrate now if we go and paste this in here. Verification failed. So. We tampered with the token, but because the token was signed with that 2048 bit key, it's not verified. And I did try to just like generate a new token. I tried to sign it with a non algorithm, all these different basic attacks that you can do, but none of them worked. So the next thing that I did here was to see if there were any known vulnerabilities in the Python JWT package, which is being used. And if we're going to have a look at the package information, we'll see very quickly that all versions are now deprecated. That's not a good sign. And then below it says that versions 3.3.4 fix a vulnerability which lets an attacker with a valid token reuse its signature with modified claims, CVE to follow. So that sounds exactly like what we want to do. It basically says the same thing there, but down here it says that an attacker who possesses a single valid JWT can create a new token with forged claims. And that's what we want to do. And it's due to an inconsistency between the JWT parsers used by Python JWT and JW Crypto. By mixing compact and JSON representations, an attacker can trick JW Crypto into parsing different claims than those over which a signature is validated by JW Crypto. So there isn't a POC right here, but there is an automated unit test. And I went to have a look at this and then basically started trying to put together a script based on this. So it kind of embeds a JWT inside another JWT. And we'll see what this looks like shortly. I spent probably five or 10 minutes trying to put this together. And then I run into a lot of issues with Python on Pirate OS and um, with libraries and trying to install libraries and stuff. And I end up just going and looking for a PWC, which I did find. So let's go over to this GitHub repo. You can see that it is a Python script. It will take in a token. And then we pass in the claim that we want to inject and that should be it. So let's try, I don't even need to clone the repo. Let's just download the Python script. Do code hack.py. We can paste this in here. Let's have a look at the script. So you can see it creates a new token here. The new payload, we've got a header and then it's attaching our fake payload. And then we have this protected and then another header, and then our original payload and our original signature. So the fake payload doesn't actually have a signature, but it's still just going to use the signature, which is verified against the original payload. Let's try it. Let's do python hack.py. And OK, we're going to run into these problems. OK, I can now do sudo apps get install. JW Crypto. Okay. Yeah, they've changed the way that you install Python packages. I don't know if this is a pirate specific thing, but I can't do pip install. I have to use sudo apt get install. And whenever I do that, quite a lot of the time, the packages just aren't available. So anyway, it wants us to give a JWT. Let's do it. Let's give it our JWT from earlier, the unmodified one. And it also wants the injected claim. So the claim is, what format does it want the claim in? That's not very clear to me. Let's go back to the script and see if there is an example. 
So it takes an injected claim in the form of key equals value. Okay, so the key is equal to role and the value is equal to administrator. There we go. It gives us a new token. Notice that it's actually in quotes inside these curly braces and I believe we need to use those as well. So let's go and find out. We'll try and get the flag. Oh, can I just paste it in here? Execute. There we go. There's our flag. Last time I did it in burp repeater. Let's just go and see what it looks like. So yeah, here we go. So it's still in the authorization and you can see that we have a payload inside the payload. It's quite confusing to look at. But yeah, that's how we can solve that one. A combination of the 403 bypass and then the JWT attack. The next challenge is called Serial Flow, and I've already downloaded the source code. Let's just go and open up the web page as well. And we get this nice looking interface. Let's have a look at our dev tools while it's loading. We have anything of interest in here. We have index, Let's scroll down. Okay, a lot of this stuff is just related to the images on screen. That's fine. There aren't any buttons or anything to click on. Let's just go and have a look at the source code this time. We'll see that we've got this app.py. Basically, most of our code is in here. We might want to know where the flag is as well. So there's a flag.txt. It's moved to the root directory and given a random name, which is an indication then that we need to get code execution because either we're going to need to find out what the file name is, first of all, before we can retrieve it in the browser, or we're going to need to list the files to find out what it's called and then print it. So let's go back to app.py. Notice we have a Flask application and render template, so potential SSTI. And we have this memcached thing. I hadn't actually seen this before. And an address and port number here, a local port. And we've got one other endpoint that we didn't see there, which was set. And it takes a UI color, and then it's going to set the session cookie UI color key to equal the value that was set. And then Whenever we go to the home page, it's redirecting us to the home page. And whenever we go back to the home page, it will render the template along with that UI color. So if we go back here and do set and do UI color, oh, that doesn't look like good spelling. Oh, maybe it is. Okay. Let's just try it. There we go. Didn't really seem to do anything at all. UI color equals test. Go to burp suite, set UI color equals test, and yeah, it just redirects. So it gives us a session cookie, redirects us. We could launch our active scan. I don't believe it came back with anything interesting the last time though. Let's go back to app.py. So yeah, there's not really too much for us to look at here. I actually spent quite a long time looking into random stuff. I didn't really understand why this was here. It seemed like a lot to put in for error handling and was wondering, could we control some of what was going into the error messages? Maybe there's like prototype pollution or something. Retrospectively, I realized that I should have looked closer into this just because it's something I hadn't really seen before. And if we go and search for mcache, let's do like mcached Python vulns. We will find some interesting results here. There is a Hattrix page on pen testing memcache, so that would be worth looking into. I did try the steps that were listed on that page as well. And in fact, whenever I searched this previously, let me do, how do I change to, yeah, let's do any time in the past year. Oh, okay. Did it on Google, so maybe I was just getting better results, but let's try and do it in the past month. Interesting, okay. Um, let me, I'll take this to Google. All right, so we search, we get similar results. Let us do past year. Oh, okay. Whenever I did this previously, this top 10 web hacking techniques came up far quicker than did in the video, which is always pretty typical. But um, yeah, there is a article here, memcached command injections in PyLibMC. It was one of the top 10 hacking techniques of 2023. And there is a blog post here, which we can go and have a look into about the vulnerability. This is not a vulnerability that I'm going to be able to explain very well, so I recommend that you read through the article. But essentially, this is building on some research that was done in 2014 on memcached injection techniques. And in this case, it's using Flash Sessions. It says here that it allows you to use Redis memcached key value stores as a session backend. By default, Python pickle library used for data serialization. 
the memcache supports both plain text and binary protocols. Commands and data sequences are terminated by CRLF. So if we can inject a CRLF and separate the data and the commands, we can potentially inject our own commands. This shows you how the commands are structured and what the common commands are. The problem is that we're not actually able to inject those CRLFs. So I'm trying to find here. Yeah, one obstacle is that we can't set those special characters in the HTTP header. However, there is this logic implemented at the cookies processing function, which basically says that we can use special sequences like backslash 012 to represent the new line and backslash 015 to represent the return feed. So we can use this encoding to inject our CRLF and then we can use the Python pickle deserialization vulnerability. This is quite a common attack using the reduce function to execute some command. So here's a POC. You can see it's doing the pickle dumps. This is just the flask session key, not value the, the key or the name. And it is going to encode our payload. Let's take a look at it and see what it looks like. Here's um, what it looks like on the network side. And they trace through the code down here at the bottom. I'm just going to take a copy of the POC. Let's go and create an exploit.py and paste this in. So some of the stuff doesn't matter. We probably want to change this because we're not going to see a ping to local host on the remote server because we don't have access to the server side terminal. Actually, I got stuck on this for a while. So what I was trying to do is trying to curl my own server and I wasn't getting a connection back. And I eventually checked the local Docker instance and noticed that it was actually saying curl command not found. So that's the reason I wasn't getting a connection back, but I couldn't get a reverse shell either. And I know now that other people did get a reverse shell working. So I'm not too sure what I was doing wrong, but we basically want to change this anyway. And I couldn't find a good way to exfiltrate the flag. So the approach I went with was to copy it. So we can basically say we want to copy the flag. We don't know what it's called, but we know it's going to begin with flag and end with .txt and be in the root directory. So that's enough for us to say that we want to copy anything that begins with flag and ends with .txt. And we want to copy it too application slash templates slash index dot html and if we go and have a look at app.py then what's basically happening here we're going to call this set root it's going to update our session cookie with our polluted session cookie and then we're going to redirect to the home page but the home page is going to render index.html which should be our flag so i think that's it let's just go and update this we also want to obviously print out the payload so that we can copy and paste it so i'm going to do print and then generate exploit. There we go. Let's go and do Python exploit and it's going to come back with our payload. We can take a copy of this. We'll go back to the web page. We'll do our set UI color equals and just whatever you want. We get some error. That's all right. I'm just going to send this to the repeater. We will paste in our session cookie as that value that we just copied. Send. We're going to get a lot of errors. I noticed even testing this locally I would say like nine times out of 10, whenever you send a payload, it just crashes the server and the server restarts. I don't know, is my payload less reliable than some of them? But you can see that it's not actually doing too much for us. There we go. All right, that's looking better. So you can see it's actually 302 found and it looks like it's tried to execute our command. Let's follow the redirection and there's our flag. Okay, it is Wednesday evening, and that means that Hack the Box did decide to extend the CTF to Thursday. And that means that I can demonstrate the testimonial challenge, which I managed to get solved. I've got it running at the moment, and there are two sites that we can connect to. The first one is an interactive site, and the second is just this weird character stuff. So we would go and have a look at this one. We can submit a testimonial. Maybe we'd try and inject some characters and things like that. But None of these links do anything and we do actually have the source code downloaded that we can just go and take a look at. I'm going to try and go through this one quite quickly because the video is already quite long. So if there's any more detail you want, I'll try and make the write-up on Gitbook a little bit more detailed. But basically we've got this Go application and it is using gRPC. Uh, disclaimer, I don't know much about Go or pretty much anything that was involved in the challenge. So the gRPC and also there was some mention of protocol buffers and Chi router and some things that I didn't really know exactly what to investigate at the beginning. 
And we have this temple as well, which is like the templating language for Go. So that was kind of a hint that maybe there would be some SSTI involved at some point. And in fact, actually, if we go and have a look at one of the files, client.go, so you can see there's this port and that's what it's connecting to. That's basically that second site that we just saw where it would show us those weird characters. That is what it's making a connection to. That's a gRPC server. And then the client is going to send off the customer and testimonial. So they're the two text boxes that we just filled in on the website, the testimonial and the customer. And you can see that it's actually filtering out the characters which are being sent in the customer field. I found this Git repo, which has a lot of gRPC related tools, and I tried to access the gRPC CLI. And whenever you have a look at that, I think it actually says it's deprecated and they recommend that you, oh, it just says it needs to be built from a source and it should be moved. The current state is not up to par with user friendliness. So they recommend using gRP curl. Let's go and have a look at that tool. And yeah, this allows us to interact with that second server directly without going through the client. So if the client is filtering some of the characters we're putting in, maybe we can just try to communicate with the server directly and then send off a testimonial that doesn't go through one of those filters. So if you go through this Git repo, it gives you a lot of different commands that we can use. We want to try and list the services that are available. Then we can try to invoke RPCs and things like that. So let's go and download it. We'll go and get the latest release here. And then extract it. So let's go back and get the second URL. And if we just try to run this, it'll come up and, oh, it doesn't come up with the help menu. We need to actually specify it. But yeah, we can bring up the help menu here. I just went through the GitHub and had a look at the usage guide there as it gives you some better examples. But okay, we've got the, IP, let us try and do this then. Um, we'll put in the IP in the port and then we'll do list. And it says that the first record does not look like a TLS handshake. Well, if you have a look at the GitHub, you'll also see that you can supply plain text if it doesn't like TLS. But we get this other error saying it doesn't support the reflection API. And there's not actually a lot we can do here apart from we can try to use some offline files. So if we go back to our code, we do actually have a PB, I think it's in here, PB. Yeah, we've got ptypes.proto, which has some of the properties of the testimonials that we submitted, and then also the function that we can call. So we can actually specify that. So let's do challenge PB. Oh, I needed to specify the import path. And then we specify dash proto, and that is going to be the name of that file. So it was ptypes.proto. And then we can try, actually, let's try and do the list first of all. Oh, too many arguments. I believe I need to put in the server and the port number at the end. Well, not right at the end, before the command. ptypes.proto. Okay, I didn't type that correctly either. There we go, Ricky service. So now we can also describe that as well. We can change it to describe Ricky service and it'll come back. And then we can basically drill down on that as well. We can now say submit testimonial and get information about it. But of course, what we want to do is actually try to make a submission. So at the moment, let's just actually, we'll update what we've got. We've already got it set to submit testimonial. And we basically just want to send some data. I don't know why I'm going all the way back here. I just need to go back before the IP address. Yeah, we want to send some data. And this is in JSON format. So I was going to say, well, I'll copy and paste this, but I might as well just do it manually at this stage. So we've got a customer. Let's say the customer is called Cat. And then we also have the testimonial. And there we go. Let's say the testimonial is also Cat. It came back and said it can't be used with describe because we didn't want to use that. There we go. Testimonial submitted successfully. So let's go and have a look at the website, refresh the page, and look at this. We've now got another testimonial from Cat, and that didn't go through the client.go, which is actually checking whether we put any special characters in that. 
I actually got stuck here for a while as well. So I've just come back over to the code. Let's have a look at our grpc.go file. So basically, whenever we send one of those testimonials, it gets written into the folder public slash testimonials, which you can see here. And it has three in it by default. We won't actually be able to see any of those on the website, any of the new ones that get written because of the permissions, but we can see the old ones. And that means if we overwrite the old ones, we could also view the contents of those. But a .txt file isn't going to execute. It's not a PHP server, so we can't upload like a PHP reverse shell or something like that. However, there is a potential directory traversal here because it's using public testimonials. It's taking our input. So if we were to put in here dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash and then like flag.txt, it could write a flag.txt to the root directory and that could contain whatever we want. But again, it's not particularly useful. We want to retrieve the flag.txt and we don't even know what it's called yet because it has a random name. So we need to list the files in the directory first or get command execution so that we can use a wildcard with a cat command. So I tested this out locally. I basically just made sure that we could actually write to a file in another directory and it works fine. My next thinking was maybe we can write to a file which will be rendered with that temple library, which will then we'll be able to use SSTI. There are some payloads for that on hat tricks and things like that. That didn't work for me either. So the next approach was to try and overwrite the temple file itself. So rather than the index page loading all of this, maybe we can just have it load our own malicious file. And this is basically how that file looked. So I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to do this, but we're basically importing OS, which was already imported. I'm not too sure if this is the best approach to do this, but we have a function which is gonna do our command. In this case, we're just listing the files in the root directory, and then we're going to return the output of that and render it as a template. So it should, then if we list the files in the root directory, it'll return all of the items here. The only thing is it combines them into one so there'll be no spaces in it and I couldn't find an actual easy way to fix that. So this is good enough for me. I then gave this code to ChatGPT and said, can you put this into one of those curl command things for me? And it said, yes, no problem. So I'm gonna take a copy of this and it's still got our local host IP and port number in it. So let's go and update that with the official one where you can paste that in and let's try and refresh the page. There we go. So we can now see that it's listing the files in the root directory. Here is our flag.txt file. So I'm gonna go back. Now what we we'll basically do is say, we wanna change this to a cat and then put in the flag.txt. What I'm gonna do is just take a copy of the command we just gave and paste that in. So right here, where is it? Cats and then flag.txt. Looking good. Let us paste that in. Oh, does not include. Okay, I missed a character. Looking better. Refresh the page and there is our flag. Anyway, that is gonna wrap it up this video. We solved seven out of nine web challenges. I didn't really look at the other categories. I was playing with Team Heckler and they had a look at some of the other categories. I had a very quick look at Pwn and then I just decided to stick to web because I used to play CTFs and just try all of the categories and then I decided to try and limit it to just like one category per CTF or just look at a couple of hard challenges from multiple categories. Otherwise you just get burnt out just trying to do all the challenges and then make write-ups and make videos and things like that. It takes a lot of time. So yeah. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to see more challenge walkthroughs, I'd recommend you check out Sloppy Joe Pirate's channel. I know that he solved most of the challenges. He always puts together great walkthroughs and has them uploaded really quickly after the event. So I'll try and leave a link to that in the description or in the comments. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.